Hello, I'm Mark Small, solicitor, and you're watching SEN Unplugged. In today's edition, we're going to talk about the right to education for young people who've reached the age of 19 and who have education, health and care plans. Now, you might be thinking, well, why is this going to be relevant to me? Well, it's going to be relevant to you because it shouldn't be assumed that just because your child has got an EHC plan, that it will continue until they reach the age of 25. Most local authorities will try to cease the EHC plan when they finish in their school or perhaps sixth form provision linked to their special school. Um, and that generally is when they reach the age of 19. And at 19, the local authorities will say, we don't want to provide any further education. Your support will be provided through social care under the CARE Act. So let's explore in detail the, the general duties that local authorities have to observe when a young person reaches the age of 19. So in the first instance, it may be surprising for me to say this, but there is no gen general right under the Children and Families Act which says that the local authority must provide education to a young person up to the age of 25. The power that's granted by the Children and Families Act is merely that the local authority is required to maintain the EHC plan should it be necessary and the Act allows them to maintain it should it be necessary up to the age of 25. There's no certainty over when education should continue and importantly when it should cease and if you look at the SEN Code of Practice of January 2015 there's no clear guidance on when education should cease although it provides guidance on the factors that need to be considered. So some key questions here um, are what are the expectations that you have for, for the young person or, and what does the young person himself want to do? Because bear in mind under the Children Families Act it's the young person when they're 16 plus that is given rights under this legislation subject of course to them having mental capacity. So what we're really going to look at here is when should education cease and how is that going to be approached by your local authority? One of the key things that people have to, I think, consider is what is meant by the term education? Many local authorities, in my experience, view education as a means to an end, and that end is the attainment of qualifications. Um, and the previous legislation uh, under the Learning Skills Act allowed local authorities to fund young people um, in post-19 education if they could show progression and stretch and thus it was all about attaining qualifications and if it was shown that they couldn't then they could legitimately cease funding through the education funding agency or at least that's what happened in practice so very few young people 19 plus had learning disability assessments that provided them with funding in post-19 education one of the key things that young people should think about and their families are what are the outcomes of further education? Um, because it's in setting the outcomes that, that we can determine the appropriate education that should follow. In terms of thinking about a working definition of education and what's meant by it, it's useful to have regard to, to case law. Now, we don't normally like to be too legalistic in these videos, but it's important to be thinking about how the law views it. Because I can tell you, it isn't about the attainment of qualifications. So there was a case a long time ago involving Bromley Council and the Senate Tribunal in 1999, which, which basically gave an idea of, you know, how we need to approach the term of what is education. So in that case, it was said that education is not just about scholastic instruction. It wasn't just about obtaining qualifications. It could be the acquisition of basic skills in preparation for the child or young person's life. So, and that those could be basic as supporting eating and drinking skills, self-help skills. So it isn't just about perhaps taking formal qualifications like GCSEs and A-levels, and then perhaps moving into um, higher education at university. For some children and young people, they might not obtain formal qualifications, and it might be about the development of those self-help and independent skills, which, which, are, which are critical to them in moving into adulthood. 
So we need to be thinking about what those skills are when we're casting the EHC plan. The FCN Code of Practice provides some guidance in respect of the considerations that a local authority has to have in deciding whether the young person should continue to access education. And so it's important to consider these when you're making a request for additional provision. So paragraph 7.6 of the code says that all students aged 16 to 19 and up to the age of 25 where they have an EHC plan should follow a coherent programme of study which provides something called progression and stretch. And part of that coherent programme of study should enable the young person to achieve the best possible outcomes. And that's the language used in the code. So key thing to be thinking about is what is the course that the young person is going to be doing? How does it develop them? And how does it lead to the meeting of the outcomes as set out in the EHC plan? Then you have paragraph 8.77 of the, of the code. And that really talks about young people who perhaps have done very well and they're either going to be moving into employment or they're going into higher education, perhaps through university. There may also be other youngsters who don't want to remain in education, but will require support through health and social care services. So one of the things that the local authority perhaps could say is, well, you don't need formal education as such. What you need are activities that are funded through social care and health. And in those circumstances, those learning opportunities don't require the education, health and care plan. And that's a factor that should be taken into account by the local authority. Uh, paragraph 9.150 of the code says that the, the local authority in collaboration with the young person and their parents, if appropriate, subject to their capacity, should use the annual review process to consider whether the young person still requires special educational needs provision provided through an education, health and care plan. And the key thing is, are there still outcomes that the young person needs to meet to enable them to prepare for adulthood? And that really is the gist of why the legislation stretched to 25, because it was about empowering children and young people to either go into higher education or to be in a situation where they're able to access an independent life, perhaps with support through social care or health service. So we need to be thinking about that at the annual review process and certainly before the young person reaches the age of 19. So some things that parents and carers need to be thinking about are, you know, what is the long term goal? Uh, are we looking at formal education still through accredited packages? Are we looking at things like perhaps that may be through social care in supported living? You know, what is the outcome that's intended? Because ultimately that will dictate whether special educational needs provision is still necessary and whether it's necessary for an EHC plan. We then have paragraph 9.151 of the SCN Code of Practice. And that basically says that the local authority shouldn't just cease an education and health and care plan because the young person reaches 19. To do so would be unlawful. What they have to do is look at the education and training outcomes and identify the pathway that that young person has into adulthood, perhaps because they've had a Care Act assessment by social care. And essentially, that EHC plan can be used beyond 19 to help them access those additional training and educational opportunities that may be provided through, for example, specialist FE colleges which all young people will have a right of access should they wish to do so. Now, one of the things the local authority has to be clear about, and that's what 9.151 says, is that the local authority has to be clear if it's going to cease an education health and care plan, that special needs provision is no longer necessary. And so at the, at the annual review where that decision perhaps is taken, there will need to be expert evidence that says there aren't, there aren't any perhaps training or education outcomes that can be further specified and that perhaps the young person has reached their, their maximum in terms of their potential and also that they've perhaps they've got the skills um, already so they don't need to, to repeat what they've already done and thus they should move then naturally into perhaps services provided by other agencies. The important thing though is that the local authority has to have regards to the outcomes that have been set out in that EHC plan and decide whether they've been met 
or perhaps need to be adjusted if they have. Paragraph 9.152 of the uh, of the SCN code also identifies that one of the factors the local authority should consider is whether the young person would benefit from remaining within education to further meet the outcomes that have been specified, perhaps to consolidate their learning. That doesn't mean that the young person just has to continually repeat courses they've already done, but it but it, but it does give the flexibility to say, perhaps because maybe of the child's difficulties and the, the extent of them, that they need a bit, they need a bit longer to um, fully acquire the skills that have been set as the outcome. Um, so there's not an arbitrary removal of provision just because the young person reaches the age of 19. We then have paragraph 9.200 of the code. And essentially here, it, this, this replicates the statutory test. If the young person moves into employment, if the young person no longer needs the special education needs provision, then if they've met their training and education outcomes, then this is where the local authority has a justification to be able to cease the education health and care plan and thus cease the local authority's responsibility for ensuring that the child's needs and now the young person's needs, of course, are, are being met. Um, and thus at that point, if an EHC plan is ceased, that would pass the young person over to adult social care um, if they're eligible to receive services under the Care Act. Now, there's an important case um, called Buckinghamshire County Council versus SJ. Now, this is an important case because it illustrates some of the kind of factors that have to be applied by a local authority when they're considering whether an EHC plan is still necessary. So essentially what the upper tier held was that just because a young person hasn't made perhaps progress as measured by P levels or as measured by any academic qualification, just because they haven't made progress that's demonstrated in those areas does not mean they don't need special educational needs provision. And qualifications are not the marker of whether an EHC plan is still necessary. Um, one of the, the key factors are looking at the needs of the young person as a whole and identifying whether the um, outcomes have been met and whether there are new outcomes that need to be met in developing perhaps the basic or should I say the functional skills of the young person, the ability to communicate, the ability to perhaps um, write a shopping list. Uh, the ability to go out independently and access the community. These are all basic life skills that have an educational component and thus, depending on the circumstances, may necessitate special educational needs provision for the young person and thus the continuation of their EHC plan. So what the Buckinghamshire case means in practice for people is that the local authority has to have an open and clear dialogue with you um, perhaps even as far back as the uh, year 11 annual review, so that there can be a clear agreed plan of action. So where the young person is remaining within education, you know, what are the long-term outcomes for up to 19 and beyond? And what's the purpose of the educational provision that's going to be provided? Because it is important to be clear. So what's the importance of the Buckinghamshire case and what does it mean in practice? Essentially what it means is local authorities have to work with families to identify, perhaps even at the year 11 annual review, when the young person is 15, 16, what the long-term objectives, what the long-term outcomes, to use the, the phrase from the code, what, what are they? So what's going to be the provision provided post 16 and what might, that, what might the young person need post 19? in order to meet their overall outcomes. What we need to look at as well, perhaps as the young person completes year 13, is um, are there any further educational pathways open to the young person? So the, the act and the legislation doesn't simply say that the young person should stay in education for the sake of it and simply redo qualifications that they've already got. What it's looking at is that progression and stretch as I identified earlier on. So what's the next step for the young person and how can the young, how can the young person participate um, in making that next step? Does it need an education, health and care plan? 
what a lot of local authorities do at this point is to engage health and social care, particularly adult social care, and actually say, well, there isn't really any more education that we can provide. We're not going to offer you specialist colleges because they're too expensive, and therefore your, the young person's needs are going to be met through a combination of adult social care provision and perhaps some health provision. And, and that's it. We're not going to have an EHC plan. Thus, one of the key things for parents at this stage, I would say in the year, uh, year 12, year 12, year 13, is going to be getting advice from professionals like the psychologist or the speech therapist or occupational therapist to identify what further outcomes perhaps are realistic for the young person, given their trajectory to date, and what special educational needs provision is still required. Because if you can make a case that there is a need for education, then just because the local authority can't provide it doesn't mean you can't ask for it. And generally, where they can't provide it, that opens up your ability, and certainly the young person's ability, to seek specialist placements in FE colleges. Um, and those, um, as I said uh, much, much earlier, those previously were gatekeeped by local authorities under the old legislation. And very few young people really had the ability to access them unless the local authority provided its agreement. Well, now, you don't need the local authority's agreement because if, if, if you're unhappy with the local authority's decision, perhaps to refuse to, to name such a place, then you can appeal to the SCN tribunal. That's a right that you didn't have under the old legislation. So if we look at cessation of EHC plans in that context, um, the following slides will demonstrate the kinds of things that need to be taken into account by local authorities when they cease an EHC plan. So when we think about cessation, what we're really saying is that the local authority is deciding that the EHC plan is no longer required. And they, get, and they will no longer therefore be responsible for the child or young person. So in the context of, of what we've been talking about, that the relevant legislation is section 45, and section 45 basically says the local authority can cease an EHG plan if it's no longer responsible for the child or young person, or if it, or if it determines that it's no longer necessary for the plan to be maintained. So the circumstances in which it's no longer necessary for the local authority to maintain a plan are where the young person or the child does no longer require special needs provision, i.e. the support that's been specified in section F of the education health and care plan. Where a young person no longer requires the special educational needs provision specified in the plan, a local authority has to still have regard to whether the education and training outcomes of the plan have been achieved. And they would generally try to do this through the annual review process. So one of the things to think about on cessation, which is really important, is that the EHC plan will be in a force unless it's seized by the local authority or something happens which discharges the local authority's duty. So, for example, in this a case would be that the young person reaches 25 and EHC plans cease once the youngster reaches the end of the academic year on which they're 25. Other factors might also be that the young person goes into employment. So an EHC plan wouldn't be necessary if the young person is moving into employment. Or sometimes the young person might just say, do you know what, I don't really want to engage in education. And therefore, the local authority could cease the EHC plan. Although it would still have general duties to try and re-engage the young person um, in training and educational opportunities. How it does that will be set out in the local offer. So really, when assessing an EHC plan, local authorities need to think very carefully about how they make decisions in respect of perhaps, are the special educational needs of the young person still significant? Is the special educational needs provision that's been specified in the plan still necessary? Are there any additional resources that are required? Have the outcomes been met? And what further education and training might the young person need and, and what is available to them? And so those are important questions to, for the local authority to be able to ask itself, uh, and perhaps they would do that effectively in consultation with the young person and the family at the annual review. One of the problems that I think parents and carers need to be aware of here is that often one of the difficulties is actually with the EHC plan itself. 
because it's not specific and quantified, it's very easy for the local authority to argue that the, that the young person doesn't need the special educational needs provision that's written in it, because that special educational needs provision is often written generically to reflect the school that the young person is attending. So you need to be very, very careful about what's in your EHC plan. And you need to make sure that the EHC plan is specific and quantified in respect of the support that's needed. It shouldn't just be written for school, particularly when the young person's in FE, and also the very specific programmes that are required. Because again, often EHC plans envisage perhaps lots of different subjects to reflect a secondary curriculum. Well, that's not the case in FE. Uh, a young person may take one particular course. They might do other things on top of that, perhaps a literacy or a functional skills course. But those are the things, therefore, that need to be recorded in the provision so that when you get to a point of cessation, you can look at both whether the provision is still relevant and also whether there are outcomes that are necessary in respect of those areas, particularly around things like independence and self-help and general learning, um, general learning activities like literacy and numeracy, and then of course, specific courses that the young person might be interested in. So annual reviews become extremely important and historically they're handled in an appalling way by local authorities. They're not done on time. They're not processed quickly enough. The EHC plans are not amended and parents and the young people are not given rights of appeal um, in a timely way. Um, one of the things that parents will have to be careful of is that FE providers often don't have the breadth of provision that perhaps is available within the school sector. So, for example, specialist teaching and specialist therapies may not be available in FE. So you need to be thinking about these things in good time and making sure that if the young person needs them, that they're specified in the EHC plan. It's also very important to ensure that the outcomes are clear and are measurable and that the training and educational outcomes um, are very clear. Uh, as I said, that's a longer term process that should start before the child leaves their school so that then you can demonstrate a clear trajectory in seeking post-19 educational provision. So that provides an overview of the right to education and the factors in which a local authority can cease an education, health and care plan. I think one of the key things from my experience is ensuring that the EHC plans are specific and quantified in terms of the provision, that there are clear outcomes, that there are clear intentions regarding education and training, and that you access as much information you can about further education options, and particularly to look at the specialist colleges that are available, and perhaps would allow a young person to extend the range of opportunities that are in front of them. Um, and it's important to do that and have a clear plan of action in place. Um, and to be putting that forward for the young person or for the young person to be doing that themselves through the annual review process. And that way, you should be able to challenge effectively any decision where the local authority seeks to cease the EHC plan. Because I'm absolutely sure that when the young person reaches 19, they will naturally try to remove the EHC plan and push the young person into social care. Well, the law doesn't allow them to do that and thus they should be challenged where it so occurs. That's it for this edition of SEN Unplugged. Um, I hope you found that interesting. As ever, please comment, share, subscribe and like. Um, you've been watching SEN Unplugged. I'm Mark Small. Let's make SEN great again. Thank you.